It's time for the Biblical Prophecy Program with your host, Dr. Alan Kirshner of Eschatos Ministries. Why Isaiah 26 verses 19 through 21 support the pre-wrath view. Hey, welcome back everyone to another episode of the Biblical Prophecy Program. Uh, Before I begin the program, I want to give a reminder that I currently support my family through this ministry. So if you benefit from this program or other resources at Eschatos Ministries, please consider supporting us by becoming an Eschatos Partner, which is giving on a monthly basis. And you can go to alankirshner.com and sign up. Okay, I have two announcements before we begin. First of all, there's a, uh, a Bible Prophecy Conference Uh, Yes, in person, not virtual. (laughs) Uh, We're going to be getting back into having Bible seminars, Bible prophecy seminars and conferences. So there's the Minnesota Bible Prophecy Conference coming up next weekend. That's May 7th through the 8th. So it's a two-day conference, Friday night and then Saturday. And it will be at the Conquering King Fellowship at their new church uh, venue. And that's, gonna be, that's in uh, Invergrove Heights, Minnesota. You can go to alankirshner.com. We have the flyer. You can register there. It's going to be, uh, I, I am super excited about this conference because I've been wanting to do a conference on this topic for a very long time. And specifically, uh, the topic is the celestial disturbances. And we're going to trace this event and show that this event, when you compare scripture with scripture, you know, good old-fashioned, biblical interpretation, the only conclusion you can come to is the pre-wrath view. And we're going to see what happens on the front end of the celestial disturbances, that is, what, what happens before the celestial disturbances occur, and what will happen afterwards. And we're going to see a just a beautiful consensus, consistency. I'm just surprised a lot more people do not see this consistency of that the the great tribulation occurs before this event and the day of the Lord's wrath occurs after this event. Uh, So, and we're going to look at what Joel says about it, Matthew, Luke, Peter, Paul, and John. Uh, And not Mary. No, I'm just kidding. What we're going to do is, and and again, that is May 7th through 8th. Uh, We've got people signing up for it. Um, So, if, if you're in Wisconsin, Iowa, of course, Minnesota, be sure to try to make it to this this conference uh, because, again, this is going to be an exciting time. We've kind of spread things out a little bit uh, so we can ha- have more time be- be- between the sessions. And that time, you know, just more time to fellowship. And um, so it's going to be myself and Ryan Habana, who's a pastor of Conquering King Fellowship and also a, he's uh, an author of some pre-wrath books. And he's got a, um, uh, a film... Uh, I'll have to post this as well. He's got a film coming up, a forthcoming uh, documentary film uh, that you're not going to want to uh, miss. And so you're, you're going to learn all about this at the at the conference. But um, yeah, try to make this conference. I, I, again, I, I'm not just saying that. I'm very excited about this conference. Uh, the other announcement, and this is this is the big announcement, and that is that the Ministry Magazine has been published. In fact, as I'm speaking right now, uh, it has hit the post office. And uh, the the first issue of Biblical Prophecy Magazine, that's the name of it, Biblical Prophecy Magazine, it's going to be published three times a year. So the magazine is going to be print and digital. It's just, it's bundled together. So it's not like, you, you know, uh, if you get, if you purchase the print uh, you will have access to the digital. So you have to you have to purchase the print, not just the digital. And uh, you can go to alankirshner.com and you can subscribe to the magazine. Now, the subscription is per issue. This is not going to be an annual subscription. It's per issue. You subscribe. You'll get charged uh, four to- or, uh, three times a year because it's published three times a year. So every four months. And you can cancel any time if you want. Um, however, if you become an Eschatos partner, Eschatos partner is giving on a monthly basis, uh, you'll be able to, you'll have a free subscription. We'll send you the magazine free every time it, uh, it comes out. For this debut, uh, issue of the magazine, um, I, I wrote the, uh, the main article called Why Biblical Prophecy Matters. And then, uh, two other authors have contributed to it, uh, Ryan Habitum 
He wrote an article called The Vindication of the Saints in Revelation 20, verse 4. And Travis Snow has written an article, uh, Passover, the End Times and the Return of Jesus. So this is the debut issue magazine. um, And so you can you can also order back issues, right? If you missed if you missed some issues, you can order a, a, a print or a reprint back issue of it, and we can send you that. And for international subscribers, uh, it's probably going to be two to three weeks. All right, there's there's an obvious delay in international subscribers, but you will receive your copy within about three weeks after it is uh, printed. Okay, let's get to the topic of the episode. And, and, and again, I, I need to mention this. I, I, I apologize for taking a hiatus <laughs> uh, on the Biblical Prophecy Program. I just had to. I had to bang out this magazine. Uh, this has been in the works since last summer. I mean, it's not the only thing I've been working on. I've been working on uh, other um, pr- writing projects as well. It's coming down the pipe. But... I just had to take a hiatus on the Biblical Prophecy Program uh, for that reason and for the reason that, uh, you know, I, my family, we, we moved from New Jersey to Wisconsin. And that, let me tell you, it's just, it's, I'm not, <laughs> it, it's been an ordeal, a saga. Let me, let me just say that. Uh, that being said, let's get into it. Okay, why, why Isaiah 26, 19 through 21? A common question of where do believers go after the rapture, right? What, what is the destination of the rapture? We know that the rapture, that they meet Jesus in the clouds, right? That's unequivocal. Uh, we, we know that to be the case because Paul teaches that in 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, 4. He, so the, the rapture, they meet Jesus in the sky. Uh, and then what? Right? Do they immediately come down to earth? Are they, do they escort Christ immediately to the, to the earth, the physical earth as post-tribulationists teach? Um, or uh, do they just kind of remain in the air? Right? Or are they escorted uh, to, to heaven before the throne of the Father? Uh, well, pre-wrath teaches that, that after the rapture, Jesus escorts the people of God, all of saints, uh, before the the Father in heaven. Not permanently. We're not going to be there permanently. Uh, We're going to be there during the wrath of God. And then eventually we're going to descend, as Revelation 21, 22 teaches, God's people, they descend to earth in the new Jerusalem, right? To be forever with Christ on this restored earth. Uh, Well, there's, there's, first of all, there's three explicit and I would actually say four explicit uh, passages, passages that give us this answer. First passage, 2 Corinthians 4.14. Uh, again, in the context of the resurrection, I talked about the rapture. But of course, when I talk about the rapture, we have to also understand that the rapture and the resurrection, these are, Paul teaches, these are twofold events. It's not the same event, right? The resurrection happens first, and then immediately, or very soon afterwards, we will be caught up. Uh, to meet the Lord in the air. And so 2 Corinthians 4.14 says, We do so because we know that the one who raised up Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will bring us with you into his, that is the Father's, presence. Of course, that's heaven. And the other passages, uh, so before Jesus, before his departure, Jesus promised uh, he says in John 14, 2 through 3, There are many dwelling places in my Father's house. Otherwise, I would have told you, because I am going away to make ready a place for you. And if I go and make ready a place for you, I will come again and take you to be with me, so that where I am, you may be also. Right there. So this, this is, of course, in the context, this is speaking of the rapture. Jesus is going to return and take us, and not just take us, right? But where? Where the Father is? In heaven. Uh, the other passage would be uh, Revelation 7, 13 through 15. Of course, pre-wrath argues that this great multitude who, that you know, appear in heaven uh, out of the great tribulation, 
uh, that this is the result. This is the result of the rapture. They have resurrected bodies here. And it reads, Then one of the elders asked me, These dressed in long white robes, who are they and where have they come from? So I said to him, My Lord, you know the answer. Then he said to me, These are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God. And they serve him day and night in his temple. And the one seated on the throne will shelter them. Again, that's Revelation chapter 7, 13 through 15. Okay, the fourth passage, and this is the, the focus here. And this, this fourth passage does not get the attention that it deserves. Uh, there, but there, there's a lot going on here. And I believe that this passage uh, supports uh, the pre-tribulation, or, and I believe that this passage supports uh, the pre-wrath view. Uh, in fact, I think it argues, and I'm, I'm going to explain why, it argues against the post-tribulational viewpoint. Let me, let me first of all read Isaiah 26, verse, verses 19 through 21. Your dead will come back to life. Your corpses will rise up. Wake up and shout joyfully. You who live in the ground, for you will grow like plants drenched with the morning dew. And the earth will bring forth its dead spirits. Go, my people. Enter your inner rooms. Close your doors behind you. Hide for a little while until his angry judgment is over. For look, the Lord is coming out of the place where he lives to punish the sin of those who live on the earth. The earth will display the blood shed on it. It will no longer cover up its slain. Okay, notice the undeniable resurrection language here. In fact, this is next to Daniel chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 2, is the most explicit resurrection passage in the Old Testament. There's only a, uh, a handful of, of uh, resurrection passage, passages in the, in the Old Testament, and this is one of the most explicit uh, resurrection passages. And we know that the rapture is connected with the resurrection. And so it follows here, notice that the resurrection okay, happens first, before before the wrath of God, God's eschatological wrath. God's wrath doesn't happen before the resurrection. It happens after the resurrection. It's very explicit here. In fact, that's the whole point of protecting. You have the resurrection, right? And they enter the inner rooms. Now, these inner rooms can be nothing more than in heaven, not on earth. They're in heaven. I'm going to explain why that is uh, the case, the uh, when you compare scripture with scripture, you see that these a, after the resurrection, right? These other passages show that the God's people are escorted in heaven before the throne, and so th when we come to Isaiah twenty six, these inner rooms have to be located in heaven. All right, and also where it says that the Lord is coming out of. The place where he lives. Where is that? That's heaven. And so you interpret. This is this is a an interpretive, a, a foundational, interpretive principle that that a, a lot of prophecy teachers don't apply. And that is you you interpret the implicit with the explicit, not the other way around. You get that all the time. You find a lot of prophecy teachers, they'll, they'll find some obscure verse, you know, and, and they build their whole theology, their whole eschatological framework filtered through some obscure prophetic verse. No, that's not how you do it. You find the explicit passages and you interpret the implicit in light of the explicit. In fact, that's what we're going to be doing in our conference uh, in Minnesota next weekend. We're going to show, we're going to begin with the explicit passages, to use theological language, the chair passages, and you, and you take those passages and you, you interpret the, the more, in, uh, or the, uh, the implicit passages, prophetic passages, passages in light of the more explicit. And so when you do that with Isaiah 26, you compare this with the other passages, uh, the inner rooms, 
where God's saints are going to be hiding during God's wrath or protected during God's wrath is going to be in heaven. The, where God comes out of his place to punish those, uh, to punish the wicked is going to be, he's coming out of uh, heaven. That's where, so, you know, when, when Christ begins to punish his people through the trumpet and the bow judgments, right? Um, he's not, he's not going to be in heaven. He's going to be active, punishing the wicked. And of course, he's, we know that it's not just going to be Jesus himself, uh, but he's going to do it through uh, vessels of, of angels. Angels have a great responsibility of pouring out the wrath of God uh, through the trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments. And um, so we, we have to, again, we have to interpret uh, the, in, the implicit through the, ex, um, in light of the explicit. Okay, also look at, I want to point out here that this passage in Isaiah 26 has a connection with Micah 1, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Let me, let me read this. Uh, notice the, um, the allusions here, uh, or the intertextuality. Listen, all you nations. Pay attention, all inhabitants of earth. The sovereign Lord will act as a witness against you. The Lord will accuse you from his majestic palace. Of course, that's in heaven. Look, the Lord is coming out of his dwelling place. Sound familiar? He will what? Descend. He will descend and march on the earth's mountaintops. So the imagery here, the tra tra trajectory is from upwards to downwards. This would suggest that God comes out of his abode in heaven. And then it says, The mountains will crumble beneath him, and the valleys will split apart like wax before a fire, like water dumped down a steep slope. Oh, you know, let me point out also, I know I just read this, but John 14 talks about this inner room uh, notion. Uh, let's see here. The uh, So John 14, oh, here it is. Yeah, There are many dwelling places in my father's house. I think that's a link to Isaiah 26 where it talks about the inner rooms. Uh, he, Jesus is making a place prepared for us. And what do we see in Revelation 21 and 22, right? The new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem, I believe, is going to be, when, when Isaiah 20, 26 talks about the, you know, uh, go um, when he says, go my people, enter your inner rooms. I don't think this is just merely metaphoric. I actually think this is going to happen. Yeah, when we're escorted, we're going to be before the throne of the Father, but we're also going to have an abode ourselves uh, with the new Jerusalem, which has rooms. And again, we're going to eventually descend to earth from the new Jerusalem in our inner rooms. So isn't it interesting? You have this, this motif of the inner rooms, our own personal abodes, right? The inner rooms, you have that in Isaiah 26, in Revelation um I'm sorry, in uh, Isaiah 26, John 14, Re Revelation 21, 22. Okay, um, one other point here is, look at, so I, I've, uh, I've read Isaiah 26, Isaiah 26, 19 through 21. 19 through 21. But look at the first, look at the verses, uh, Look at the, the, the first uh, few verses before verse 19 where, at, so 19 is talking about the resurrection, right? What, what event happens just before that? It says, Isaiah 26, 16 through 18, O Lord, they sought you in distress. Of course, this is uh, Israel. They could only whisper a prayer. Your chastening was upon them. As the pregnant woman approaches the time to give birth, she writhes and cries out in her labor pains. Thus were we before you, O Lord. We were pregnant. We writhed in labor. We gave birth, as it seems, only to wind. We could not accomplish deliverance for the earth, nor, the, nor were inhabitants of the world born." Now, why is that passage important? Because when, and then you, of course, you continue to read and you get, you have the event of the resurrection and then, and then of course, the wrath of God. 
So these three events, Israel is being chastened uh, with, with tribulation, uh, with uh, trials and persecution. And then you have the resurrection and God's wrath. Where else do you see that pattern? Well, you see that in Daniel chapter 11 and verse in chapter 12. You see that pattern uh, in, well, you see it in, uh, uh, in Luke 21. Uh, you see it in Matthew 24, even though I believe that Matthew 24, the elect there, it's specifically, of course, talking about uh, believers, the elect, because they're going to be persecuted for his name. Um, but you have that pattern there. And then you have it uh, in the, um, I believe you also have it in the book of Revelation. So you, you have, before Jesus returns, uh, you have Israel is being, is being persecuted. And I, think, I believe that's a, cha a chastening of, of Israel. And there's going to be a remnant that comes out of that. And then what happens after that? Well, we know, and then of course for, for, the, uh, for, for the church, uh, believing Jews and Gentiles, well, there's going to be a great tribulation for them. It's going to be cut short. Their great tribulation is going to be cut short, uh, you know, with otherwise no elect would be saved. I know it says no flesh would be saved. Well, it, it, it's clearly in the context of the flesh is there speaking of the, the delimiter is not talking about every single person on earth. It's obviously talking about believing flesh there. No flesh, no believers would be. In other words, if the great tribulation continued, if Satan, if Satan's, if Satan and Antichrist's intentions um, were fully met, then no believer would be alive. They'd all be put to death. But those days are going to be cut short for the sake of the elect. And then what do you have? You have the resurrection and the rapture. And what do you have after the resurrection and the rapture? Well, you have the day of the Lord's wrath. It, it, it's, a, it's consistent. <laughs> um, and this argues against post-tribulationists because post-tribulationists, and again, I understand there's a few different views of post-tribulationists, but would argue the church is on earth during God's wrath of the trumpet judgments. Of course, they'll, they'll say, well, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're protected at this time. And, and actually, they'll, they'll cite this pas pas uh, passage, Isaiah 26, they'll, they'll cite that and go, look, at, they're, they're, they're in the inner rooms. They're being, they're being protected here. Um, but of course, the problem there is what I showed earlier that no, the inner rooms and where God comes out uh, out of his place is located in heaven. This is not on earth. Uh, p God's people are going to be protected in heaven during the, the day of the Lord's wrath. Well, let me get back to this point of Isaiah 26 argue, argues against post-tribulationists because it states, explicitly situates the resurrection, right? The resurrection before the wrath of God. Whereas post-tribulationists, many post-tribulationists, they have the resurrection after the trumpet judgments of God. But that framework is contradicted by Scripture here in Isaiah 26. And of course, I would argue by Paul and Jesus uh, and the book of Re Revelation. Consistently, the resurrection rapture will occur before the wrath of God. It will not occur after the wrath of God or even during the wrath of God. I mean, I know some post-tribulations will try to argue that the resurrection occurs between the trumpet judge, judgments of God and the bowl judgments of God. No, you can't have that. It's very consistent. So Isaiah 26, in the context here, and of course when you compare it to other, other scriptures, well, you have a tribulation period for Israel, and at the same time, simultaneously, uh, you have the persecution, Antichrist persecution against, against believers. And then you have the resurrection rapture and then followed by the, the day of the Lord's wrath. But I, I really believe the pre-wrath view is, is a natural 
the most plausible, natural reading of Scripture because, again, we're not focused on just one passage in the Bible and then we're filtering everything in it. We're, we're allowing th- this overlay, this natural overlay. And when you do that, when you overlay these Old Testament passages uh, of Isaiah 26 and Joel 2 and uh, with you overlay it with Matthew 24 and Luke 21 and the book of Revelation and Paul's teaching. It's, it's, it's like it just a, it's a beautiful consistency of how it overlays. We're not trying to squeeze something in or uh, trying to force uh, passages to fit this passage over there. And you get just all of these type of strained ways of interpreting prophetic passages. Anyway, I hope that's been helpful. Hey, uh, sign up for a subscription to Biblical Prophecy Magazine. We are going to have original research in this magazine. This is not going to be your typical Bible prophecy magazine. Uh, it's it's This is going to be very solid material in these magazines. Uh, and so, again, three times a year, go to alankirshner.com and sign up for that. Anyway, I, I hope that's been helpful, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.